Hello and welcome to On Books. This week, I'm sharing with you How Buildings Learn by Stuart Graham. This was one of my favorite books from the past year. Uh, in the past year, I've read 35 books, and of them, I'm going to be sharing the top four with you uh, in this episode and then over the next few episodes. So I hope you're really excited about that. It doesn't matter if you've read the book or not. What you can expect in this episode is a summary of the book, a few takeaways, I'll do a reading, a few pages of the book to give you a sense of you know what it's like, and then some final thoughts on how you can apply the book to your life. So let's get right into it. This is How Buildings Learn by Stuart Brand. How Buildings Learn is a book about buildings, but it's also a book about time, and that's what drew me in. The question of, well, what happens to the objects we create over time. So buildings is the subject of the book and buildings inevitably change with time. What makes some buildings get better while others get worse? How does time act as an architect that shapes our buildings? So this is the question. And this is the question that was on Stuart Brand's mind when he set out to work on this book. And in order to answer that question, he has observed buildings over time, over decades, over centuries, and brought together hundreds of photos, these kind of before and after photos, you can imagine like those weight loss photos before and after of buildings, more or less. Uh, and through his observations, he's come up with some uh, really poetic narrative of vocabulary and principles explaining the transformation of these buildings over time and what we can learn from it. I'm going to read now from the first few pages of How Buildings Learn. So this is chapter one, low. Year after year, the cultural elite of San Francisco is treated to the sight of its preeminent ladies, resplendently gowned, lined up in public, waiting to pee. The occasion is intermission at the annual gala opening of the opera. The ground floor ladies' room at the opera house is too small. The men's isn't. This has been the case since the place was built in 1932. As the women are lined up right next to the lobby bar, their plight has become a traditional topic of conversation. The compliments and jokes never change. Well, neither does the ladies' room. Between the world and our ideas of the world is a fascinating kink. Architecture, we imagine, is permanent, and so our buildings thwart us because they discount time. They misuse time. Almost no buildings adapt well. They're designed not to adapt. Also, budgeting and finance not to, constructed not to, administered not to, maintained not not to, regulated and taxed, not to, even remodeled, not to. Yes, that's all about not designed to adapt. This is, is the main theme that we've hit on here. But, but he says, but all buildings except monuments adapt anyway, however poorly, because the usages in and around us are constantly changing. Aha. So this is one of the main conflicts in the book, one of the things that really bothers Brand, and that he sets out to write and research this book to, to bring clarity to. This problem that he notices is that we are making buildings, often so short-sighted, to only consider the first tenant in the building, or in our society more, more widely, you might think, just the first use of an item, and not necessarily where that will go after. To Then instead, how do we think about time as an architect, right? Time architects and adapts our buildings. Yet we always give the main credit to the architect, which is the first person who made the building. These are famous people and you know we, we appreciate them and we laud them in our society, but we don't always consider what happens you know, day two, maintaining this through time. For this, I'm gonna context shift a little and show you a video, or I'm just gonna play you some audio, of a series called How Buildings Learn that Stuart Brand did for the BBC after the publication of this book. Here he's talking about Frank Lloyd Wright and how he would create a building. And because he didn't have built into his, his thinking a longer term vision of maintaining and learning himself from the building, he created this same problem with all of his buildings from his first until the last throughout his life. This is Stuart Brand in How Buildings Learn. Frank Lloyd Wright is considered to be the greatest American architect of all time. This is one of his buildings, and it's beautiful, but it leaked from day one. The Marin County Civic Center in California was the last project of his life, 
but it leaked just as badly as all of his earlier buildings. His clients would say, the roof leaks, and he would joke. That's how you can tell it's a roof. Someone should have told him, that's how you can tell it's a failure. All right, that's Stuart Brand from the BBC documentary he put together called How Buildings Learn. And uh, I really love the book. I think the documentaries, it's pretty good, but it feels, I just feel like the book reads a little bit more poetic. Like, I just love the photos and language of the book. So if you do watch it, it's on YouTube. You can watch it for free, but I would still really recommend, and I would say the book's even better in my opinion. So how do buildings learn? Well, if we consider that all buildings are predictions, the architect is predicting how the building is going to be used. The architect's predicting how money and technology and fashion are going to influence the building that he or she creates. So a building is a prediction. If we understand that as a given, but add to it that all predictions are wrong, knowing that over time, the predictions that we make are going to have to bend in some ways, then we can see this book that Stuart Brand has put together as assembling what might be called steps towards adaptive architecture. And that's what he calls it, adaptive architecture, thinking about how what we create adapts over time. And he says quite poetically here, honoring the future begins with honoring the past. And that's exactly what this book does. It honors our future long-term thinking and choices and decisions, all this, by looking at lessons from the past. And like I said, he's assembled dozens, hundreds of um, photographs here. What you can expect to see are, you know, some famous buildings like I.M. Pace, uh, Media Lab, for example, at MIT, George Washington's home at Mount Vernon, uh, as well as Brownstones in Greenwich Village, before and after. And what can we learn by looking at the same structure, the same site, the same building over time? And there's just hundreds of these examples. It's so wonderful. So that's what Stuart Brand's doing. Over the 12 chapters in this book, he's giving us vocabulary, he's giving us design principles, he's giving us tons of examples of how we can think to create architecture that is more adaptive over time. I'm going to read a little bit more here and then finish this off with just, you know, give you a few more takeaways from the book. So he says, a question I asked everyone while working on the book was, what makes a building come to be loved? A 13-year-old boy in Maine had the most succinct answer. Age, he said. Apparently, the older a building gets, the more we have respect and affection for its evident maturity, for the accumulated human investment it shows, for the attractive patina it wears, muted bricks, worn stairs, colorfully stained roofs, lush vines. Age is so valued that in America, it is far more often fake than real. In a pub-style bar and restaurant, you find British antique oak wall paneling perfectly replicated in high-density pylourethane. On the roof are, sorry, I'll read that again. On the roof are fiber cement shingles, molded and colored to look like worn natural slate. Age plus adaptability is what makes a building come to be loved. The building learns from its occupants and they learn from it. That's another episode of On Books. I hope you enjoyed hearing about how buildings learn. If you'd like to learn more about Stuart Brand, uh, there's so much that we didn't have time to cover in this episode, but he has written another book, which is one of my favorite books of all time, called The Clock of the Long Now. It's a short little book of essays um, with some cameos by amazing people like, I don't know, Brian Eno and some other wonderful people in there. And uh, it's all about long-term thinking. He has an organization called the long now, which is at longnow.org. And, you know, while this book is about buildings, like I said, it's really about time. Uh, There's a quote that I love by one of Stuart Brand's colleagues, Danny Hillis. And he says, there are problems that are impossible if you think about them in two year terms, which everyone does, but they're easy if you think about them in 50 year terms. So I think that is really, you know, what this book's about and what a lot of Stuart Brand's work at The Long Now is about. It's about thinking of problems, you know, I'm so inspired of that. Things like, uh, things that just won't be solved in my lifetime. Things like global warming, which is a problem that started way before I was born and will, you know, will carry on. The solution won't come until likely after I'm not on this planet anymore. 
issues of race, issues of education. You know, these are the big, <laughs> the big problems, the big things that we need to work on. And, you know, sometimes it's not always convenient that it's just going to get solved within your lifetime. And so how do we, you know, intergenerationally, I think that's a word I just made up, but if that makes sense, like, you know, how do we communicate to the unborn yet, the people that aren't born on this planet, how do we transmit and, and carry, uh, an alignment, a consciousness beyond, you know, so that we can carry our mission and values into the future. And I think that's what this book does really beautifully with building specifically. Um, and I think that's what the work at the long now is doing with a lot of other, uh, different bets, long bets about the future. And so I'll put all the show notes there. You can check that out. I think I'd also be remiss uh, to not finish this episode to say that on this book, How Buildings Learn, there's a quote from Jane Jacobs, which who is legendary, who says <laughs> about the book, she says, a classic and probably a work of genius. Are you kidding me? Jane Jacobs, author of uh, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, one of the, the number one, you know, uh, canonical books about city planning is saying that this book is a work of genius. So I just needed to mention that. Also, Jane Jacobs' documentary, you need to watch that as well. It's fascinating along similar lines. Um, man, I have so much to say about all this. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, I know I did. I really loved reading this book. I really like sharing it with you uh, and thinking about it this year. If you have any questions or would love to follow up with the show, I'd suggest you subscribe. You can subscribe on iTunes. You can, I'm on Twitter, at on book show, at on book show. You can email chris at on dash books.com. If you have anything, any thoughts, any suggestions, any you know extra context to this. And we have tons of past episodes. Um, like I said, uh, a few on the Long Now Foundation, Clock of the Long Now that you can look for. We also have Letters to a Young Poet, Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, a book about growth mindset, Sex at Dawn, Mating in Captivity, so many on there that you can look through the catalog of past episodes. So I hope you enjoyed On Books. Please subscribe, maybe give a rating if you like the show, that always helps out. And uh, yeah, oh, and I teach at onemonth.com. I'll just plug, it's onemonth.com is where I have online classes teaching people how to code. So those are all the things. You can check me out, you can follow up. My name's Chris, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Have a great day, bye.